Welcome to Media Path. I am Louise Palenker. And I'm Fritz Coleman. Today's show is especially potent. So you may want to pace yourselves, pace your listening, or at least stretch first and take some deep breaths. Fritz and I are going to share what we've been watching, and that excitement will be rapidly followed by back-to-back content creators for you. We have Georgia Wright and Kenia Hale. They're here to talk about their groundbreaking podcast, Inherited, a climate storytelling show for and about young people. And then media and music producer Spencer Proffer will join us to discuss his brilliant new documentary about the song American Pie called The Day the Music Died. Fritz, what have you got for us? Well, in deference to our talented second guest, Spencer Proffer, I'm going to recommend one of his earlier works that I've watched a couple of times. It's called Chasing Train. This is a documentary of maybe the most celebrated jazz artist of all time, John Coltrane. He was a jazz sax player whose talent and creativity has achieved mythical status among jazz players and fans the world over. It starts with his youth and the pain he suffered in losing several loved ones all at one time, which ultimately led him to bury his feelings in music. And then through relentless determination, he worked his way into the musical stratosphere. At a fairly young age, he began to prove he was special and apart by working with giants like Miles Davis and Dizzy Gillespie. Along the way, he fell into the dark groove of drug addiction. He had a bad heroin habit that he had to kick. That was at a period of time in the 50s and 60s and early 70s when musicians thought that drugs made them more creative, which was a huge mistake. The film takes you through his struggles with life and love. It all builds toward the high point of his career, and that is the creation of his magnum opus, an album called The Love Supreme. This music was, as Train admitted, his way of communicating with God. In other words, thanking God and showing the miracle of love in the universe. Coltrane was a profoundly spiritual man. And like the artistic masters of the Renaissance proved, some of the world's greatest works of art are born from men analyzing their relationship with God. And as I say, our guest in a few minutes, Spencer Proffer, who did the documentary about Don McLean's epic song, American Pie, called The Day the Music Died, was a co-producer on this film as well. Even if you're not a jazz fan, even if you're like me and you can't get your head completely wrapped around all of Coltrane's intricate and complicated music, you will be inspired by this man's devotion to his art. It's called Chasing Train. So, yes, Fritz, as as you said so eloquently, also with me as well, my ear does not speak the language of this music. He starts at bebop, which already has me stumped, and then he turns even further left. I'm very lost in that neighborhood, but through the film, I got to know John Coltrane, and that was a gift. I do love listening to the words of those who are so moved by his work. In this piece, you know, we have so many brilliant people who their language is jazz. Wynton Marsalis, Bill Clinton, when he's talking about the arts, is a, is a jazz musician. In another interview, Bill Clinton said that there is a religion around John Coltrane. There are people that think he has almost a, a spiritual, you know, he's somewhere between God and man. That could be. It's really fascinating. And so uh, it was a gift to, to be able to spend some time with him through this film. So especially when the film reaches Japan and the reverence that they have for him in that country is just beautiful. It's a gorgeous piece of work which really introduces you to the man, John Coltrane, who is so remarkably loving, brilliant, and warm. I watched something a little bit different, Fritz. I've been watching Severance. It comes to us on Apple TV from producer Ben Stiller. It's a psychological, philosophical thriller which presents a dystopian solution to the pull of our work-life divide. What if the person you are at work has no memory of the person you are at home and vice versa? Adam Scott plays Mark, a man in mourning who agrees to have his mind severed into separate work and home consciousnesses. At Lumen Industries, Mark leads a team of employees who have been similarly altered. But of course, this surgically manipulated contrivance is not built to last. Much like in Jurassic Park, Frankenstein, and the cat in the hat, science (laughs) and nature and humanity will insist on spoiling the best laid, ill-advised cat, doctor, or corporate plans. Thus, the grippingly compelling storyline as a recently dismissed, well-loved co-worker named Petey appears to mark in his outside life with a dire warning 
of the truth about what lies within Lumen. Severance lavishly and hilariously lambaste cult psychology, self-help, and corporate culture while raising intriguing questions about consciousness, memory, morality, reality, mindfulness, and purpose. It features beautifully written roles from Patricia Arquette, Christopher Walken, and John Turturro. You will find Severance on Apple+. Plus. I love the idea of being able to separate your work life from your home life because you'd probably sleep a lot better if that were possible. Well, it's like a good idea on paper. <laughs> Once <laughs> no? again, yes. Oh, okay. Do not unleash the madness. Okay. So I want to welcome our guest. We have Georgia Wright and we have Kenia Hale. Georgia Wright is a former theater kid who uses her storytelling instincts to bring us imaginative and carefully created audio programming that pulls us into important narratives. She is working with Kenia Hale, who is a Yale grad and a researcher at Princeton University. Georgia is the co-creator of Inherited, a New York Times recommended podcast about the youth climate movement. Tell us more about that, Georgia. Yeah, so Inherited, uh, as you mentioned, is a storytelling podcast by, for, and about young people who are coming to terms with the existential threat of our time, which is to say climate change. Um, you know, and the trajectory of the show has changed a lot from season one to season two. We are currently uh, releasing our second season with YR Media and our distributor Critical Frequency. And so YR Media, which is an Oakland-based nonprofit um, that supports young storytellers and media creators and journalists nationwide, um, it has helped us uh, expand our programming. And so essentially we have a cohort of nine storytellers. Kania is one of our amazing storytellers who have made this season possible. And so uh, yeah, the first season was a little bit more traditional narrative podcasting, but this season, uh, each episode has uh, different stories from different storytellers around the world talking about in some way, shape or form how climate is impacting their lives. So, uh, yeah, so so I'd love for Kania, maybe you can uh, also like introduce your specific story a little bit because it's a great example of the type of work that we're trying to do here. And it's also coming out tomorrow, which is very exciting. Oh, wow. Very cool. Yeah, no, I'm super, super excited about this and just really excited to have this opportunity with Inherited as well. Um, so as um, Georgia said, I submitted a story a few months ago, basically about an experience of climate change that I experienced. Um, I'm from Ohio originally. And so um, my family and I just kind of went through a few different um, really intense uh, bouts of like windstorms and stuff. And we've just been like noticing the ways that the climate has been changing, um, like literally just from what we've been witnessing in our time in Ohio. Um, so I got to write up this script and also um, interview, like go back to Ohio and interview my family um, about their experiences as well. And so it's like part, I think, I don't know, like part ethnography, part like very intimate um like land-based uh interview as well so it was just a really uh fun experience and I, i'm really grateful that i got to uh engage with it this is really cool because you you said there were nine selections and either of you can answer this question in the new season this is in the new two. season right uh but you had 75 submissions from 20 different countries that's a pretty wide scope that's that's very inspirational yeah. It was amazing. I mean, we weren't expecting, you know, we knew our, our first season did fairly well in terms of like the, the people who did listen liked it, but we didn't think that we really even had the listenership to get such a response to our pitch form. But I think that if there's one thing that I learned from that, it's that um, young people everywhere are really eager to have a space and a platform to tell climate stories. And every single young person has a different way that climate intersects in their life, whether it's, you know, like Kenia, it's coming into their literal backyard and affecting the shape and the trajectory of their yard, or it's something a little bit more nebulous where, you know, maybe it's, it's, uh, something about the, the way that they're engaging with activism or, uh, we have a couple more experimental segments as well. In fact, uh, we have like one fiction segment that aired in the first episode. So this is all under the umbrella of the youth climate movement, right? That's sort of the general uh, yeah. body that you find yourself within. What does that mean? Well, you know, the first season was a little bit more geared towards the youth climate movement in as much as it was, you know, thinking specifically about young people who are lobbying for political activism. 
Um, but we decided that we wanted to kind of like expand what that looked like because activism and storytelling um, can look like a lot of different things. And so we really describe ourselves now more as a storytelling podcast um, about young people and climate change, because the reality is that some people are able to be activists. Some people, you know, go to the streets and bring their bullhorns and stuff. I used to do that type of work, um, but it's not sustainable for everyone. It's also not financially available to everybody. Uh, you know, cl climate activism requires a lot of a lot of time, and so uh, so there are many people out there who. Uh, have a connection to climate change and want to tell a story about climate change, which in my opinion is itself a form of activism. Um, but we don't want to pin it necessarily just to people who are like very deeply involved in like political lobbying, um, which isn't to say that they're not wonderful and important and they still have a role in this season as well. But I think that part of our outlook this season is that um, we are all, we all have a reason to want to talk about climate change by virtue of being young right now you know like there's nobody there's nobody in our generation who should be excluded from this conversation because we are all being impacted by it so what you're saying is the people with the largest story have the smallest platform and you're offering that to them i mean you know i would like to think that in in theory that's great i don't you know i think that we could we could work on sort of our our practice of that but that's that's what we're hoping to do. I think that there are a lot of people out there um, who are, for example, one of the stories that's coming up is um, a bunch of, uh, one of our storytellers is from, from Lagos, Nigeria. And so she's interviewing a lot of young climate activists who are in different places around um, Africa. Some of them are also in Nigeria, like her. Um, and part of the reason why I think there was such an eagerness for, for this pitch call is because there are a lot of folks who aren't getting recognized in the same way that like Greta Thunberg is getting recognized. You know, we love Greta, nothing against Greta. She's great. But like, she's one kid when there's actually like millions of young people who each have their own design and own way of interpreting uh, what is happening to our earth. And they all, you know, from different geographic locations in the world all get to see these different effects and different sides of sort of the massive, you know, cube that is climate change our, our timing of this interview is pretty um pretty auspicious uh, when you look at what happened in southwestern florida last week do you have any thoughts about um the destruction and is that a harbinger of things to come and they're only going to get worse and is this making the point you're trying to make it's time to do something i mean it's horrible what what happened with hurricane Ian is horrible um it is definitely not uncommon. It is happening more and more frequently. And I think one of the things that I'm interested in is like seeing how now that people are reporting on this as what they, as what it is, which is like a climate fuel disaster, maybe that'll have some impacts on the way that we funnel like federal funding into like climate change um, mitigation, mm -hmm. you know, policies. But yeah, I, I, Kani, I, I don't know if you have any anything you want to add. No, yeah, I just wanted to say, like, <clears throat> it's actually interesting um, that this would happen last week because my my oldest brother, well, my older brother, he lives in Florida. Um, so like last week, I was kind of texting him, making sure he was OK. He's all good. Um, but I think it's interesting that like all summer I spent like interviewing my family in Ohio about how climate change affected them there. And now, just last week, I'm also talking to my older brother about how climate change is affecting him across the country. So it's like this thing that's just so pervasive across, like literally no matter where you are at any time. Um, yeah. Right. Well, I our audience is, is maybe consists of a lot of boomers. Help us understand the term BIPOC, B-I-P-O-C, and uh, help us underst understand how climate change is specifically uh, impacted by those who experienced historically colonialism. Some of the terms that are in your literature are really some really profound and important terms that, that, that force us to take a large look at what we're doing to our planet and why. Yeah. Um, well, uh, BIPOC stands for Black Indigenous People of Color, which is a, you know, very broad term to describe people who are not white, essentially. Um, 
And one of our stories uh, in the second episode um, is by Jasmine Hardy, a young Black storyteller in Oakland, and she reports on environmental racism. So I definitely urge anybody who's interested in learning more about the intersection of climate and race to listen to her story. It's called Oakland's Invisible War. Um, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, I'll give my answer and then, you know, Kenny, I, I want to hear your answer for sure. But um, climate is, you know, it's an issue that manifests in so many different ways. But as with a lot of issues in the world, like the healthcare system or the prison industrial complex, you know, primarily impacts people who are already sort of like at the margins and already being neglected by society. And because of the, you know, colonial and white supremacist uh, origins of our country, there's a lot of folks who are uh, built into the system as like not having the same amount of resources and not getting the same uh, sort of attention uh, as folks like, you know, who are already white, well off and can afford to sort of be in uh, in the, the public eye, I suppose. And so, um, yeah, I, I think as with anything, it sort of climate change kicks people who are already down. And a lot of the communities that are on the front lines are, have been historically neglected for, for centuries. So, yeah. I, I mean, I don't if know you if just you look at the metaphor yeah. of like trailer parks and tornadoes, that's, I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. With that well, metaphor. when I was a kid, there'd always be after a tornado footage of a trailer park. And, you know, because those homes aren't like don't have a foundation, they're just like strewn about. And, you know, people like us that had a house would look at that and say, why don't those people move into a house? Which is, you know, of course, the height of arrogance. But that's the, the least rooted people are in the most danger when climate uh, roars through or climate change, let's say, roars through. Yeah, I want to make sure Kania has an opportunity to answer okay. that question as yeah. well, because obviously I'm also the white person in this interview, uh -huh, yeah, so yeah. I don't think that my voice should be prioritized here. No, yeah, I mean, I was going to say I agree with everything that Georgia said. Like, I can speak from my own kind of lived experience in Ohio, um, like the ways that um, whether it be like industry or um, highways are distributed because of redlining that go through like communities of color or poor mm -hmm. communities that then leads to intergenerational asthma like my family has. Um, whether it be the fact that like, I mean, we look at Hurricane Katrina, we look at Hurricane Ida and we see like these communities that are on the coast that as these like ocean waters are rising, like who can afford to evacuate and who just like exactly. can't. You took right? the words right out of my mouth. That's the topic of discussion all week, that the poverty stricken people, not necessarily people of color, but lower uh, industri uh, lower uh, economic strata are the people that suffer the most because we'd love to evacuate. We can't. We have nowhere to go. We have no transportation. That's been the really sad part of this whole thing, I think. So it's a yeah. good point you bring up. Exactly. And oftentimes like because as Georgia mentioned, the like discriminatory history of this country, like you'll have people of lower socioeconomic statuses also intersecting with people who, because of their race or immigration status or what have you, have also been further marginalized. And it just kind of these things pile on top of each other to lead to people, um, yeah, being mm -hmm. forced to go through the brunt of climate change when often it's people who have the most money or who are the ones that are creating the most climate impact. All right. So uh, before we go, tell us how season two differs from season one. I know that you made a comment, Georgia, either in one of your podcasts or in your writing, that you guys are going to take more of a back seat and not not be the driving force in each podcast. You're going to let each one stand on its own. So how, how is two different from one? Yeah. Um, well, I think you you put it into words right there is that, you know, because we are in this extremely fortunate position of having the, uh, you know, we're, we're connected to Wire Media, um, which has a lot more funding than we have had as an independent podcast. Um, we're able to really like kind of live the dream that we had initially of having inherited be more of a community focused project rather than a like host driven show. I think there's a lot of like traditional podcasts that are very much like about the personalities and experiences of the hosts. But in this instance, Jules and I don't necessarily have the most interesting lived experience about climate change. We don't necessarily have the most interesting things to say. We have, you know, our two stories, but there are so many other stories. And it's like, how do you represent such a global problem? Probably not through just two people. Um, so I think that this new form 
format where we are able to uh, sort of like pass the proverbial microphone from storyteller to storyteller means that the sort of final product is going to be a lot more representative of the actual scope of the climate crisis, which is to say it's global, it's huge. Um, and it also means that we get way more of a sort of like, like stylistic diversity where different stories are going to sound different. Some are more journalism, some are personal essays, some are experimental, some are fiction, you know, I think it it makes the show more rich and interesting and varied. Um, and the first season, I think, is a really good primer on like sort of the youth climate movement, particularly the more like political activist side of things. But I do think that it uh, continues to be, you know, I, I think that we are very intent on continuing with this format because I think that's sort of was always the dream was to have it be a project that was a little bit more uh yeah a, a little bit bigger than than just the two of us so Kenia, talk it's been about really your, exciting yeah it really is can you i want to hear about your submission process and what it meant to you and uh how you went about putting your story forward yeah so my friend forwarded me the um the pitch call and basically i you know it, it was basically like if you have a story about climate change, it doesn't have to be rooted in journalism or anything, but just like, what is a story that you have about climate change that you want to share? And when the um, like windstorms happened to my family back in 2020, I just remember being like, I want to tell someone about this, but I didn't know, like, you know, I didn't know that there was even a platform like this. So when my friend sent this to me, I was like, wow, this is like very auspicious, like very perfect that mm -hmm. I can um, share this in this very specific space mm -hmm. and so i submitted and yeah i've just been working with georgia and jules um basically for the past few months um drafting up my story interviewing my family like figuring out how to interview like how to ask questions and how to invite people to share their authentic selves with you um how to honor the things that people share with you and also you know like even like Georgia taught me a little bit of sound design stuff too and thinking about like how different sounds and background noise and stuff like I um, wasn't able to get into like an official studio so I literally had to like sit in my closet close the door and make like a <laughs> sound studio like in my house <laughs> which is like a very kind of like intimate very DIY that's experience. the way podcasting starts too in somebody's closet <laughs> Um, but yeah, just, I, I really enjoyed my time, um, involved with, uh, Inherited. So, yeah. And are you going to remain with Inherited moving forward on season three? Um, I think the podcast call was solely for this season. Mm -hmm. Um, but I definitely love Inherited and Georgia and Jules. And like, if an opportunity ever presented itself, I would love to continue working with them. So <laughs> I'll put it this way. We don't even have a confirmed season three yet. Like <laughs> probably it's going to happen, but like we haven't. We're just, we're just trying to get through season two right now. So <laughs> the future is a little bit to be determined, but I think uh, to, to respond to you, Kania, like we, I, I think have already talked about like how are some ways that we could have some sort of like storyteller alums be involved in like future seasons. And like, if there are opportunities or workshops or things going forward, like making sure that everybody gets an invite, because I think the dream is also just to like have cool storytelling friends who like want to think and talk about this stuff, which is, you know, kind of how this season has felt is like, whoa, we have the opportunity to like learn from so many people and hear so many different stories. And like, how do we, you know, preserve that and like make sure that those connections don't just like vanish into the ether after this well, is over. Tell us more about that. Have they all had a chance to get to know one another? Well, <laughs> there was a goal of having the cohort be more like a workshop, you know, where we would all get together at the same time. But I think that we sorely underestimated how difficult it is to get nine young people's schedules to align, particularly <laughs> when some people are like starting college and like in different countries and, you know, what have you. So we're we're definitely uh, going forward. That is something I would really like to improve upon is maybe like setting some designated times a ahead of the season. That's like you have to be here at this time on this day, like yes. make time for it. Um, because I do think that the value, there is like a, a value in that, but we have had some people like Kenia, I think you, you connected with, with, um, Mukta, right. Or who, who were you able to talk to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me and Mukta, we had a good conversation and it was very sweet. Cause like she was about to go off to college and I have just ended yeah. college. So it was like a nice little mentorship moment, but Aww. yeah. Oh yeah. Mukta's our youngest storyteller. She's, 
uh, I believe, still 17. So. Still 17. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, yeah. tell us where folks can find it. Uh, you can find Inherited. Well, you can read more about Inherited at yr.media slash Inherited, or you can find Inherited wherever you get your podcast, which includes Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, all of that good stuff. So uh, just Google Inherited Podcast, it'll pop up, but um, it is on a wide variety of platforms and listening. It's super encouraged if you can leave us an Apple uh, podcast uh, rating and review, that's even better. Absolutely. So, and the new season drops tomorrow? Well, the Kania story drops tomorrow. The new season is already, we've already had two episodes come oh, out. Oh, okay. So well. we're going to have links in our show notes. Uh, just if you're listening in the car and you don't want to do anything dangerous, just go home and it'll be right there in your show notes. And Or you can just put if Inherited Podcast into Google, and I promise Google will take you there. I want to thank both of you for being with us. What thank a joy. you so much. You know, George, I have a daughter your age, and at least once a week I say, please hurry up and grow up because you have to save us from ourselves. I think your generation uh, is yes. going to do it. That's that's what they say. That's what they say. <laughs> Nobody else has. So <laughs> we, think we, we, got, we got it. <laughs> We're going to do our part, too. Thank you so okay. much. You're both Thank wonderful. You. Thank you. All right. Take care. Take Bye-bye. care. Bye-bye. Hello. Hey, Spencer, how are you? I am on the media path. Yeah, we, you are. <laughs> um, Spencer Proffer is a media and record producer who brought us the multi-platinum Come On, Feel the Noise from Quiet Riot and their Metal Health album. He is the CEO of Meteor 17, a convergence media production company. His newest brilliant creation offers us a deep examination of the iconic song American Pie. The film is called The Day the Music Died and it is streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome, Spencer. You've, well, you, thank you. you've made a film about a song that ends darkly. The girl who sings the blues offers no happy news. God moves to California. The music is dead. The singer is about to die. But defiantly, American Pie is music that continues to be relentlessly and joyfully sung. Is that defiance part of our attraction to the song? Well, let me give you a clue that will light you up. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it, it might end darkly, literally. But figuratively and emotionally, it personifies hope. And the song is 51 years old. And of course, we look at an examination how divided America was then, how it is now. But there's hope for a better day. What Don McLean did in his infinite wisdom and poetry and insight was he sensed that this song would have application to many people of many levels. My job was to take that instinct, bring it forward past, present, and future generations, which is why we have a cover from Jay Bird, who's 24 years old, grew up in England, why we have a Spanish language cover that's going to hit 20 Latin markets that the song may have been familiar to in English, but now with the reggae Spanish approach, brilliantly done by Mafio and Giancarlo. No, this is about hope for the future. I got to tell you, this this connects back to an earlier discussion before you got here that Wheezy had about your other beautiful piece of work, Chasing Train. I thought there was a similarity between John Coltrane and Don McLean, and that is there seems to be divine visitation in the creation of both of their works. I mean, Don sort of suggests that the words just came and it poured out of him and he wrote parts of it in a short period of time. And Coltrane was absolutely connected to a higher power. So I I, I feel like there was divine intervention in the creation of both of their works. Would you agree with that? Not only do I agree with that, Fritz, and that's fantastic insight, but the next four docs that I have in queue are all from people who feel that too. Steve Binder, who brought Elvis back after Colonel Parker flushed him. And I'm making the comeback special documentary with Binder for Paramount and Viacom. Eddie Kramer engineered, I don't know, five albums for Zeppelin, The Stones, two for The Beatles, two, uh, All You Need Is Love, Baby You're a Rich Man, and every Jimi Hendrix record. He got it early, but he was behind the curtain. Every one of these people, Lamont Dozier, who wrote all the big Supremes for Tops, um, Arthur Nevendel. He just passed away, didn't he? Or some one of the Lamont Dozier Holland or Holland Dozier Holland just passed. Somebody yes. passed. He now Lamont passed, his wife passed a year ago. He's very dear to me. But before he passed, we had been sculpting. Because I've known Lamont for about 30 years. I knew Lamont very dear to me as a human being. Our kids went to school together. Um when he wrote 
Standing in the Shadows, when he wrote Heat Wave, when he wrote Quicksand with the Hollands, he actually was thinking about higher power too, because it wasn't just the pop application. It was pretty deep. Think of America. Were we in a heat wave? Have we been standing in the shadows? Are we hearing the same old song? Of course, you put that in musical terms, but it's deeper than that. The higher power exists there too. That's really interesting. I want to talk for a moment about lyric interpretation. And I know that, you know, you wait till the end of the film and then you get McLean's take on it. But this is probably the stuff of college courses, right? That yes. we just love to go in and it, it doesn't it do you think that when McLean wrote the lyrics, it didn't matter whether or not we interpreted them accurately? It was almost better that we didn't? Well, ask John <laughs> John Lennon about Lucy in the Sky. Ask the Beatles, ask Elton, Bernie Taupin. The thing that's beautiful about music, look at Paul Simon with his poetry. Everybody can interpret what they hear as it relates to them. For Don, he wrote the song from his heart, not thinking what it means to you or Fritz or anybody else, what it meant to him. And if it touched the world, fantastic, it did. And it touched me as a student at UCLA when I heard it. And boy, it ring my bell. But the point is, and it's rung people's bells for the last 51 years. But I think the beauty in poetry, if you read a Tennyson, a Keats, a Shelley, a, a Shakespeare poem, you might mean, it might mean something different to you than a Wadsworth poem means to Fritz. You know, So it's all interpretive with the art form. And I think music and songs are the greatest art form in my lifetime. Beautifully said. I also think that sometimes, uh, and you mentioned Paul Simon, uh, uh, and I agree with that completely, he has very cryptic lyrics that people have questioned over time. And sometimes the more cryptic they are, the more they draw people in, and it draws analysis a little bit more. So if you don't understand it completely, it's like any great work of art. It's, e it's even more profound if you don't understand it at first. Mm. I think it's great. The first time I heard Bridge Over Troubled Water, the first time I heard Parsley Sage, what it meant to me the first time, the first time I heard Old Friends or Homeward Bound. Sure, it has its literal application, literal applications, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you go deep, it's deeper. And I think Paul Simon is the, one of the deepest poets in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. I think Don McLean with Vincent pretty deep too that song brings me to tears to this day it's such a beautiful song because it's Wait not just you see. yeah no i was going to say it i know he's singing about vincent but he's singing about every person in our lives who's genius but too delicate for the world and we Sensitive all and, yep, and we all exactly. know that we all have loved ones mm -hmm. and i i wanted to ask you um about the reason maybe humans are drawn to these metaphors might be that our dreams are metaphors. Our dreams are, you wake up and you're like, what was that? My teacher was at the supermarket with my, you know, football coach and I, there was a band playing. It's, it's a metaphor that represents our fears and our desires. I think that's what dreams are. And so when we hear that in the lyrics of the music that, that we love, I think we're drawn to want to know more, want to understand more. All day. Well, we've done, I have a book division that's run by my wife, Judy, and we have an illustrated children's book yeah. called Don, Don McLean's American Pie. It's right here. Oh, and yeah. it's about oh, wow. hopes. It's about, you can go on Amazon and you can see it. It's a good holiday item to give to kids and all. Yeah. It's for children, but it's not. It's for all of us because it speaks to dreams. It speaks to the prequel to American Pie when we all could have hope when we all know what it is to experience loss. Of course, we lost Buddy Holly, but we've lost a lot more. One of the docs that I'm making next year is called All I Have to Do is Dream. What is that? That was not only the Everly hit, I'm partnered with Del Bryant, whose parents wrote that as well as Love Hurts and Bye Bye Love and some other great songs. They were kind of the pioneers of Nashville, but we're doing a dream book that my illustrator and art director who's been with me for 38 years, Hugh Syme is putting together now. And it's all about dreams, interpretive dreams. Not only what that song made you think of, but other images. 
that cause you to dream. So I'm using every doc that I produce to extend into the thing that moves me the most, hope and dreams. I'll tell you, there are lots of interesting facts uh, in this thing. And one that really uh, gave me pause was the story of the crash site in Iowa, Clear Lake, Iowa. When the song came out, the owners of the farm in Iowa, which incidentally are very respectful to the, to the history of that now and have you know very tasteful memorials there, but the owners of the Iowa farm had no idea the song was talking about their farm. Correct. Somebody had, that, that's so that's astonishing to me. But it happened. And having the guy who owned the aircraft, the private plane that crashed, Oof. do a dive to find out why did it crash? Was it weather? Was it pilot air? Was it an ancestor of the guy who crashed Kobe Bryant's plane? We don't know. Oh my. But we do know is what it is, what it was. And my job as the producer was to bring it forward so that you and Dina and everybody who can see this and watch Paramount Plus, who believed in the vision all along, I give them huge shout out props. Bruce Gilmer, Bob Backish, Kais, Edgar, the guys who truly understand music, which is why they had MTV and VH1 and CMT. The real music people, mm -hmm. which is why this project partnered with them versus X, Y, or Z. It wasn't a pitching exercise. It was me sharing it. Thank God I have some good relationships. I shared the vision, which was embodied into the doc that you saw. I mean, it was sketched in my mind. And then we made it a reality. And it's particularly, uh, Spencer, touching to those of us in Southern California, because we all have a proprietary interest in Richie Valens. He's, a, he's an L.A. guy. He's a Bacoima, born and raised. And I thought one of the most touching parts was you uh, including her, uh, his sister in the dock and then having her meet Don at the end. Honest to God, it was like somebody going to Lourdes to be healed. She was so overtaken with emotion at the chance to meet Don McLean and thank him for writing this song because it kept the memory of her brother alive as well. That was very moving. Absolutely. The La Bamba movie was kind of a anchor, but Don being a student of pop culture, being a student of music, it was really Don's idea to embrace Connie Balance. And she was surprised. She was moved. That was real genuine. It's not mm. a reality show, but that was reality. No, she was quite beautiful in that, I thought. And then where yeah. where you did it, where the where the oh man the, the finale of your well that was, was the context because yeah. if we did it in a parking lot that's yeah. one thing, but to do it actually at the site, mm -hmm. which was the last concert before the plane took off, that was pretty poignant. There's no accidents. The accident was their interaction, the purity of the emotion, the hug. I didn't stage that. I was in L.A. Mm -hmm. It's COVID time. I wasn't allowed to go there. Yeah. But the point is, the vision of them connecting is one thing. But what happened when they connected is another. Quite beautiful. It's like they've been connected this whole time since the moment he wrote the song. And there's so many revelations in this. And the other one is that there are people that know every, I, I don't even know every lyric in the song. I, I, I go along a long, long time ago. Then I go, <laughs> and then I do that. And then you pick it up. But, but there are people in other languages that speak not a word of English, but know every single word of that song and sing it in English. And it's the only English they know. That's how it's impacted other cultures well one reason i wanted to do and this is my idea i wanted to at least pick a language and i thought spanish travels very well especially because mtb international has a very big initiative in latin markets mm -hmm. and so i was fortunate to secure a couple of young you know mafio is 36 jen carlo is 24 with huge socials or i think he's 26 but it's the next gen and how the song permeated their souls and to be able to do a version that they decorate in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Very and cool. that, but the chorus, if you note, Fritz is in English and the chorus mm -hmm. bye bye Miss American pie drove my Chevy to the levee. Don is singing that chorus with them. So that's kind of cool too. Mm -hmm. So you actually get the bonding of both cultures and application to music with Don 
and these 20 year old guys these yeah the younger 20- country band that did the beautiful harmonies oh, the, that the was acapella. quite beautiful I don't know what the name. Of, what was the name of that group? Home Free. Home Free, Home Free really and beautiful. And, are... and then that guy Ruben, I think it was his name. He was a Puerto Rican or a Cuban kid, who said, "I learned this song in my country when I was young because my mom played it." I mean, I had no idea of the intercultural significance of that song until I watched this thing. It's pretty amazing. Well, that was the purpose of this. Home Free actually was a brainchild. That duet with Don was a brainchild of Don's manager, Kurt Webster. And that was put together um, yeah, in the context not only of this doc. They did it to do it because it was the right thing to do to bring the song forward. But clearly, when I heard it, when I felt it, when I talked to Kurt about it, I talked to the band. They were very gracious about saying it should be part of the film. They'd be glad to be interviewed, talk about it, how it touched them. And it became a very important part of talk about, this. Yeah, finish that, finish that sentence. Well, I was just going to say it became an important part of the journey of the song. This isn't the journey of an artist like most docs. Mm-hmm. This is a journey of a piece of Both. poetry. Mm-hmm. So your wish list was, I would guess, pretty much fulfilled in terms of you have Brian Wilson, you have Garth Brooks, you have Weird Al. Talk about when you conceived of this project, who you'd want and who maybe you had to turn some folks away who wanted to speak about the song. No, Garth Brooks was Don McLean's idea. And that's his idea for two reasons. One, they're dear to one another. And two, all the words that Garth laid out in the dock were pure. He oh, heard man. it as a kid. He's so articulate. He's, He's so beautiful. He really, really is. And even the way he set it up and how he's the one that said he thought it was maybe the greatest song ever written. And then that whole thing when he brought Don out by surprise at Central Park was I had tears in my eyes. It was quite beautiful. Fritz, it was real. Yeah. See, the thing about this doc that I believe is the blessing to those who get the chance to see it and appreciate it is it's real. It is not a stage thing. The Central Park thing, of course, um, Garth called on and asked him to fly in. But he did it because Garth Brooks is a brilliant talent. You don't sell 100 million records by not being the Mm -hmm. real deal. Mm -hmm. But it was him. I didn't script it. Nobody scripted it. Those were Garth's words. As far as... um, who the other, the the Latin people, those are their words. Mm -hmm. Those were their feelings. Mm -hmm. I didn't script that. I just felt that they should have the platform by which to say what they felt. Rudy Perez is the guy Mm -hmm. who was, he's probably the leading Latin producer who has done Spanish language versions of songs for Beyonce, for Christina Aguilera. Mm -hmm. He's an old friend of mine. And he didn't have the time to actually produce a track but he sure made the time to speak about it. Those Don't tell him I called of, him Ruben. I apologize. His name is Ruben. It's okay. Rudy is fine. I call him Ruben. Just call him. But the <laughs> point, <laughs> you know, but the bottom line is these are all real people. So my wish list of who to speak to it was pure people. You didn't have to be famous. Garth happened to be coincidentally a superstar and have a great point of view. But some of these other people, they're new. Jade Bird, the young girl from England, she's 24 years wow. old. Not a, she's not a good. superstar. That was but beautiful. Lady Gaga's producer felt it, and he had produced Brandy Carlisle as well as Jade. He produced it in Nashville. Um, the whole idea was purity is the answer. Too many docs and too much media happens to be staged. And this is probably one of those few docs I hope it goes to where it goes. We just found out we can't qualify for a Grammy because we would have won it hands down. Other than I think Peter Jackson did a great job with the Beatles, let it be thing. But because their rule is 51% performance, our doc isn't a performance doc. It's Mm. a cinematic doc that's mm-hmm. why we went to clear Lake. that's why we shot the poignant scenes we shot it wasn't just regurgitating video after video mm-hmm. and the bottom line is i'm so proud of it it's it's good it's a legacy project for me too for really sure beautiful. and it's it's i mean the the tone and the purpose is is reverence it, like everyone brings that to the project because i think what you know we're talking about a pop song that is that is sung joyfully at bars and it's a song that's celebrated but what it's about is something really tragic and then to 
pull that kind of joy out of that tragedy is is what humans do to put one foot in front of the other and, and have meaning in, in their lives mm -hmm. and, and bring that to their children. And as you and Spencer both said at the beginning, it's this spectacular piece of poetry, but it also is a great description of that moment on the planet, the war, the civil unrest, the assassinations, the tectonic shift in music. It described the world that we were in at that moment as well. Absolutely. Boy, you're good. That's absolutely correct. That is the essence of what has permeated its longevity. And I think Don is very intuitive in that he knew that, he felt that, but he let it roll, like you said, because he was living it. And for us to get the benefit of that 51 years later, I think it's a blessing for all that gets a chance to see it. So for those of you listening to Media Path and this podcast, I urge you because you can get a subscription to Paramount Plus and see it. It's it's going to be on there for a long time. I hope as long as the song is. So 50 years from now, when I'm not around, I'll still be watching it from upstairs. Anybody that's, you know, our Asians slightly younger, it's a piece of your history. You need to watch this because it, yeah. it will it will resurrect feelings you haven't had in a long time. How do you think that, that Don looks at the song differently through the lens of time than he did in, in 1972? Does, is he kind of astounded at how prescient he was? Well, do you look at things differently today than you did when you were growing up? I do. You know what? It's an evolving experience called life. Right. And we all see things. I look at things differently today than I did 10 years ago. Being a father has touched my soul, coaching their teams, mm -hmm. being on the board of their schools meant a lot to me. I wasn't planning that when I was in my 20s. So, you know, you just pivot, you deal with it. I didn't know I'd be producing music anchor documentaries as this chapter of my life. But now that I've embraced it, I'm all in. And um, yeah, I did media stuff way back to my Billy Thorpe Laser Light Show days, where mm -hmm. I wrote a song, produced a record, and put it in planetariums and started laser light shows in my 20s. That was cool. But I didn't think I'd make a living doing that. I'm making a living doing what I'm doing, but I'm loving every minute of it. Well, then you're the winner. You know, uh, this thing uh, broke glass ceilings. This was the first record on top 40 radio at eight and a half minutes long usually it was two and a half three three and a half minutes to be a top 40 song and Correct. programmers rejected it the mu the the uh, record company thought nobody's going to play this and and don had to stick to his guns and then after the first time they played it on top 40 radio the audience rose up in defiance and said no we want you to play that song all the time so it i think it i think it was the first time a record of that length had ever been played and then you had stairway to heaven led zeppelin and and knights in white satin with a moody blues but this was the first one yeah free bird by skinner right um yeah if you look at any homework as to my own career path not to pat myself on the back but everything i've done that's been massively successful has gone against the grain for the institutions, but it's connected to the public. Quiet Riot, when Come On, Feel the Noise and Bang Your Head got on the radio. Boy, the record company hated it. Every All the gatekeepers hated it, but the kids loved it. So when it went to number one phones, all of a sudden it go. blew up. Mm -hmm. So I'm used to that Gods and Monsters, a movie I was a producer on. Nobody wanted to know about that movie. We won an Academy Award. So the point is Don McLean, I give him lots of props for sticking to his guns and learning how to take a no. He didn't know what no meant because it, it just was what it was. I know what no means because I get rejected a lot because I'm way outside the box. But being outside the box is really in the box if you connect with the kids. Tell us about your, your childhood. Did you always have good instincts? I had poor instincts. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was poor. I'm an immigrant. I came to America when I was six years old, and we lived in a place in America that not too many people would come from Germany or Poland to, which is Albuquerque, and I got beat up, and I was chastised for being a long-haired, German-speaking, young Jewish kid, <laughs> and that's okay because I learned to fight back. How did I fight back? You have no choice. So my instincts were always to turn the other cheek 
And in the words of Michelle Obama, which I admire beyond words itself, mm -hmm. when they go low, you go high. Mm -hmm. And I've managed to accept that precept way back when I heard another song, Fritz, that was a long song, like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a great line in that song. When you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. Perfect. And that's kind of how I grew up, Dina. I didn't have very much. I ate off a hot plate as a kid coming up. I did okay. I graduated college, UCLA at 20, got my law degree at 23. And I was just an overachiever because I was so poor. There was only way to go, but that was up. Wow. So let's go back to the laser light shows because I'm interested in, you know, your instinct for uh, entertaining folks and what drew you to that? Well, my friend Billy Thorpe, God rest his soul, was like the Springsteen-esque superstar in Australia. He'd come to America. Long story, not for this podcast on how we met, but we together wrote a song called Children of the Sun, which is still the number two big recurrent on Deep Tracks at Sirius XM. And that song, for its was seven minutes. It wasn't as long as American Pie, but it was seven minutes and five seconds. And it dealt with aliens from another galaxy watching the Earth self-destruct and offering everybody a dream, a better life. I developed that. I, I made it. I shopped it. I couldn't get arrested. Small label out of making Georgia Capricorn Records picked it up. It got on a few radio stations and like Quiet Riot, like American Pie went to number one because it connected to the street. And we developed the computer animated laser choreography of the words to the album, which I was part of. And I ran it at Griffith Park Planetarium here. And this is when I was 27 years old. <laughs> so, you know, you get a buck off on the album to go to the laser show, Griffith Park, where Adele just did a great concert. And uh, you get a buck off on the planetarium show if you buy the record. <laughs> so. That was cross promotion before yeah. school. <laughs> you are one of the great there marketers of all time. <laughs> That's great. D dude, that was 1977. <laughs> anyway, the point is that um, once it caught on, because again, it connected with the public, we then took that same laser light show. I premiered it at a major radio convention in San Diego called the Ruben E. Fleet Space Theater, uh, hosted by Lee Abrams who is the leading American radio programmer. Mm -hmm. I'm now making a doc on America's fascination with radio through the decades with Lee as a partner. And I premiered it there. I was a guest speaker, 1979. That took off so well that not only did it take the record everywhere, but planetariums everywhere copped what we did that became the beginning of the laser light shows. Tell us about your radio doc, because I also have a, a history in radio. We have mutual colleague and Ray De La Garza. So I want to hear yes. more about that because I obviously have a deep love for radio. Well, what I can do to tell you much more about it is you'll email me your email address. I'll send you the deck. But the <laughs> essence of it is Lee Abrams before Ray, when Ray was in high school, I love Ray. Ray's one of my dearest buddies. Yeah. Um, Lee was programming rock radio across America, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, one of the founders of XM Radio. Mm -hmm. So he reached out to me three years ago and said, I have an idea. I said, great, everybody's got ideas, tell me your <laughs> idea. And he said, blah, 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 and he wanted to do a Sonic Messengers film. Sonic Messengers is really about the message that radio would talk to the people at. 60s rock and roll, 70s singer songwriter, 80s metal, 90s alternative. I understand this stuff because I come from the music. Mm -hmm. So I said, Lee, you're onto something. Why don't we think about how it also permeated other cultures? So let's see if we can galvanize a teammate. And we did because I'm a big fan of Monty Python. And I'm very friendly with the people at CAA who represent John Cleese, mm -hmm. who is kind of the visionary behind that. We now have, this is a sneak peek, we're not making this until next year, but John Cleese is our executive producer. Mm -hmm. And nice. we're going to learn from his perspective as an Englishman through Monty Python, through that whole period, how... Um, American radio impacted the world, but that's what it is. And I'll send you the deck and you'll see what it speaks to. It's really good. It's really okay. smart. That sounds amazing. But we haven't picked our director yet. 
we haven't put the team together yet because I'm busy finishing my Elvis comeback documentary for Viacom with Stephen with Steve Binder, who was the visionary pirate who told Colonel Parker where to go. Look at the Baz Luhrmann movie, and Steve is my partner. On yeah, that. I, I, I listen. I, we, we've Weezy and I have both read books about Elvis because we've had authors on here that delve into his life. But I had no idea the darkness of Colonel Parker, what a negative influence he was on, and how controlling he was. That looks fantastic. I'm oh, and Baz Luhrmann you. did the forward for you. Good for you. No kidding. You think there's an accident here? Binder, <laughs> consult, Binder consulted on the movie. I own the book with Steve. We put it forward. We're the number one bestseller on all music books at Amazon, and we have been for a while. But we're also a bestseller at Barnes, not, not Barnes & Noble, um, Walmart, Costco, um, uh, Sam's Club, etc., because it speaks to stuff that the public didn't really know. What I'm going to do with this doc, like I did with the McLean doc, is lift the curtain on information. Bass touched on it in the movie when Elvis says to the character playing Bender, hey, so, you know, Steve, what do you think of my career? And Steve goes, it's in the toilet. It's the first time. They anybody... did that right up at the Hollywood sign. I love that conversation. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. yeah. But it didn't happen at the Hollywood sign. But Baz Luhrmann is such a great filmmaker. Yeah. He wanted to draw you in. It yeah. happened in Colonel Parker's MGM office. Oh. And Parker was embarrassed. But then he's a criminal. But he, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. he's not alive. But yeah. what we're going to do is <laughs> our doc is. Is called, and you can go onto my site, Billboard broke the story about a month ago. It's called Elvis and Steve, and it's a buddy story. Butch Cassidy and Sundance was being made at the same time. You get a lot of buddy stories, and then you have poignants, like films that were made at the time, like, uh, what was it? Um, cool Hand Luke, mm -hmm. Rebellion Against Society, mm -hmm. Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? And then you have Elvis making clam bake for Paramount because P Colonel Parker needed a big commission. Oh, so what what we're going to do is lift the curtain on all that. When's this going to drop? <clears throat> What's when, that? When's this movie going to drop? Next year. Will it be theatrical right now, or streaming or both? No, no, it's Paramount Plus. Oh, okay. And I love the fact you love Chasing Train because my director for that, John Scheinfeld, is making this stuff right now. I'll We're tell you another enough. beautiful aspect of Chasing Train was the visual aspect, the animation and the transitions between sections. It was very interpretive. It was kind of like Train's music. You know, the colors just evolved on screen and it was uh, it was cartoon-like, not cartoon-like because that underplays it, but it, it was beautiful. Dimensional. Yes, it was very, uh, it was very Lyrical impactful. And, and also, and, and the way that the home movies were incorporated uh, yeah, mm -hmm. you just well, really felt I'm like gonna give, I'm going to give one of my directors, Dave Harding, who um, he knew I was into celestial stuff. Remember, I just talked about Billy Thorpe. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the opening of Chasing Train, it's very celestial. Mm -hmm. And you see the images of a saxophone, you hear the music, and it's from another planet that you dissolve into real life. Mm -hmm. So there's some correlation there, but I give Harding a lot of credit for overseeing it, putting it together. My job is to build great teams, take my visions, and take it way further than I ever could. And wow. that's what we did. That's what I do on all my docs. Is it good or bad? I don't know, but it's what gets me off. Very so good. Uh, I mean, the, the, the proof is in the pudding, and the pudding is that as I freely admitted at the end of my little discussion of it, and Wheezy sort of substantiated my opinion, and that is I'm not enough of a, a, a music aficionado to understand all of his music. Uh, it was very interpretive and it was very, it was on another level, but I appreciated the art. I appreciated the devotion. I, de I appreciated his connection to spirituality and, yep. uh, it was so what I what I ended up saying was this is worth your while to look at, even if you're not a huge fan of that particular format of jazz. It's a beautiful it's a beautiful uh, it's a beautiful look at a devoted, pure artist. A hundred percent. The reason I did this, mm -hmm. because in my soul, I'm a Zeppelin Bowie Beatles fan yeah. mm -hmm. and a singer songwriter fan. Mm -hmm. Graham Nash, Carol King. Elton, Bernie, these are my favorite, yeah, same. Cat Stevens, mm -hmm. they're poets. But I had to do this when I got the opportunity, not because I'm a big fan of jazz, although I ran Blue Note when I was running United Artists Creative wow. when I was a kid, huh. but 
I, I understand it a little bit, not as much, though, as the true aficionados, but I do understand humanity and spirituality mm -hmm. and hope and dreams and all that. And I am gravitating toward artists that are hope, uh, that permeate hope and are full of big dreams. Mm -hmm. That's who I am. I'm a big dreamer. Right. Yeah. And, and, they're, and they're seeking connection. They are. And, and, and Train was all about love. His love yep. for God, his love for the universe, and there's such a beautiful purity in that, and uh, it drove yep. him to the heights of his creation, which was the love supreme. Yep, yep. But that's, I love that. Mm -hmm. Everybody I'm working with today, and I hope it's tomorrow and it's forever, is coming from that place, mm -hmm. be it Lamont Dozier, be it Eddie Kramer, be it you know, even Lee Abrams is a radio programmer, be it Stephen Schwartz, who wrote Pippin, Godspell Pippin, mm -hmm. in Wicked, I'm making mm -hmm. Stephen's documentary. He's an artiste. And why would he have me be that guy when he is the Andrew Lloyd Webber of America? Mm -hmm. Well, maybe because I go deep between the weeds, I go into the weeds and between the lines. And that's what I hope distinguishes stuff that my company puts out to the world. And I, I met I met Stephen in Starbucks in Toluca Lake when he was there with Winnie, the person that wrote the book for Wicked. Winnie Holtzman. Yeah. Winnie Holtzman, who is a Toluca Lake resident, as am I. And I got to meet him there, and I was so excited. And this was just at the peak of Wicked's power, when uh, you know it was it was the hottest thing on Broadway. I think you have the gift of in inclusion and collaboration. I think that people will want to work with you because you're about celebrating, you know, each of their gifts and putting teams together that are better than the sum uh, of their parts. And, mm -hmm. and that's one of your geniuses. hundred percent. And I think it harkens back to my high school, college days when I played football. Mm -hmm. And being a quarterback has two great virtues. One, quarterback gets a girl, always first. <laughs> <laughs> and number two, there's 11 guys on the team. What does that mean? That means everybody plays a different position. I like calling the place and getting out of the way. Mm -hmm. Let the team win. Mm -hmm. Let everybody get a Super Bowl ring, not just the quarterback. So I've kind of lived my life with the precepts I learned as a 16-year-old. And it works for me. I don't know how many other, call them leaders or mm -hmm. you know, quarterbacks, will let other people have a little bit of the limelight. I don't care. I can go to the back of the bus. What I care about is that the team wins and the team I want to play for is the artist. And that's why the artists will gravitate toward me because my, my mission will be to put the halo on them. I'll get a halo for doing it, but fine. I don't care. I've never been that big a halo guy, but my projects have actually done okay. And they're usually about people that aren't the most famous, but they're probably as good as it gets. Well, I think that's what, what leadership is, is letting everybody shine and having, you know, having, you, you know, your ego in, in a spot where you're, 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 you're going to shine when the project shines. You don't need to shine individually because you inherently understand that this project only shines when we all shine. And like and knowing right and, and letting people play to their strengths and knowing what lane to put folks in so that and putting people on your team that aren't going to try to, you know, maneuver and, and box anybody out. They're all going to want to have everybody shining. Those are those are leaders. That's what a leader is. Well, I have a lady who is my GM named Bethany Claypool, who is a very big visionary marketing PR person. And. Everybody on my team, from Bethany on through, if you go onto my website and look at my team, they're all A, my friends, B, they have families, they care about their families first, and none of them are so egoed out that they won't collaborate with each other. And they've all been next to me for at least a decade, if not longer. My art director, Hugh Syme, told me yesterday he's clocking his 38th year next to me. It doesn't mean that David Geffen couldn't use him to do stuff for him. It doesn't mean that all my people can't do other things, but when it comes to my projects, I don't force them to work on them. They want to. I, I want to uh, bring uh, this all back to the beautiful piece of work that Spencer Proffer produced called The Day the Music Died, The Story of American Pie, 
the uh, the masterwork of Don McLean. And I just wanted to read some quotes. These are sound bites from various stars and non-stars and various people in the music industry and people who were touched by Don's music that made these comments during your documentary. Uh, Don put into words what everybody was feeling. Here's another one. The song is woven into the fabric of American culture. Here's another one. The song means a million different things to a million different people. We talked about that. Here's one, and this was said by Garth Brooks. It is probably the greatest song ever written. And the one that really touched me, although it's on the darker side, it was a eulogy for the death of a generation. All very profound comments about this great song. Who said that last quote? I'm not sure. Wow. With death is rebirth. So Mm -hmm. it's as Don, the moment he wrote that song, he was feeling that type of way. But as he's seen by planting the song in the consciousness of of the globe, it sprung all kinds of new life. Absolutely. Is he still working? Does he do concerts? Yeah, yeah. He's in Europe now. He just sent me an email from Ireland, from Belfast. Oh, wow. And he he sent me a interview that he just did. Yeah, Kurt has been doing a good job managing him. Mm-hmm. Don is probably doing three months of dates now in Europe, wow. coming back to do more. The guy's 76 years old and he's still going because he doesn't know anything else. Graham Nash is 79 from Crosby Stills. Crazy. And Graham's very, very dear to me. We just did a book on our house where we had Carol King write the dedication. <laughs> oh, and, nice. I mean, Graham is a poet. Don is a poet. Mm-hmm. Brian Wilson is a poet. You know, Bernie Taupin is a poet. There's These are all people that I think the golden age of Renaissance music in America mm-hmm. was when these guys, 69 through 74, And what I'm really proud to do with Eddie Kramer, who I brought up earlier, he engineered a lot of this music, Zeppelin, The Stones, Beatles, etc. So for me, bringing the past forward, I've worked with Brian May from Queen. He was very much behind Bohemian Rhapsody, which only made a billion two at the box office. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay to bring classic stuff forward as long as you make it relatable mm-hmm. to the next gen. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of, that's what I'm trying to do. Mm-hmm. I think it is because it's just the human condition. So if it was relatable then, we're still humans. We still are trying to figure out, you know, young people are trying to figure out who am I? Where do I fit in? What is my life going to be about? And those themes are universal and they're consistent. So, and that's what you're identifying and, and showcasing. It's beautiful. Well, I'm trying to use media yeah. by what I know how to do to make a difference in pop culture. Some people do it with medicine. Some people do it with art. You know, everybody has their own lane. And the lane that I'm in, I'm going to double down on, which (laughs) is how to produce docs more than features. Features take four years. I could do a doc in 18 months and have a little more control. It's a lot less, uh, less moving parts to making a a 90-minute documentary than it is making a two-hour film. And you know what else, Spencer? We have access to docs now. So 20 years ago, we didn't have so much access to docs. They weren't even being shown on on TV that often. Now we, we, doc fans are finding their docs. And it's like, if you go on any platform and they know that you like docs, they show you more docs that you're gonna like. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're available. Well, what I'm trying to do is permeate the distinction from the docs that I make. One reason I love working with the people at Viacom, Paramount Plus, MTV, is they get it. Mm. They get it because they come from the music. Mm -hmm. They happen to be executives with a tremendous platform. But Bruce Gilmer, who's the president of music, is a music fan through and through. It it goes to his soul. Mm -hmm. When he was at VH1, when he was running the music for all their international companies, these are, Bob Backish was the president of MTV International. He He's a guitar player. I mean, mm-hmm. sometimes he and I talk about what guitar he's going to jam on at night when he's done running his $20 billion company. <laughs> wow. But 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 the point is, those are real people. That's why I've aligned. They've got money. They've got a machine. True. But there's a lot of people with a lot of money that don't get anywhere because they don't have vision. Oh, so well said. All right. We want to thank you for joining us. I'm going to read our, our closing credits. Once again, Spencer, where can folks find uh, your most recent piece of work? Well, you can find American Pie, the thing that Fritz went back to, on Paramount Plus, 
That's one of the streamers competing with the other guys. That's okay. My goal is to make them even more visible. Um, the Elvis doc that's coming next year will be on Paramount+. Plus. Maybe you'll come back and talk about that Elvis doc. I would love to talk to you about that when it comes out. Talk to Elliot Kendall. El- Elliot's a good guy. I met him 12 years ago when he worked at Universal. Mm-hmm. And I think he's much more effective now working for the Elliot Kendall business. Mm-hmm. He's a great guy. Mm-hmm. And he's the one that said to me, do you want to go on the Media Path doc? And I checked it out. I talked to some people. I saw who you've talked to. And I said, Count me in. Plus, I know you're a local guy, Fritz, and so am I. I grew up, I went to Fairfax High, I went to UCLA. (laughs) So I'm a local boy, too. I live in Encino, so there you go. Well, we'd love to have you in the studio for our next conversation. We'll we'll have you back with somebody that maybe you want to bring to us to talk about what, what you what you guys are working on together. You know what I might do is hmm. I might actually invite Steve Binder. Bring Steve. That would yeah. be that'd be beyond cool if you and could do that. That's the next thing. And I don't know if we have the physicality. Steve lives in Oxnard. He's oh. a little older than us, Fritz, but we can zoom it. Oh sure. And oh, the yeah. point the the point is once we get a little further along and once Paramount announces it in a big way, Mm -hmm. then of course, I'll tell Steve, I want him to do this. Actually, I'd like that idea because you guys do your homework. That's good. And you guys would get into some great conversations about your history in the music business. I would look forward to that. You could be here and- We're we're in Sherman Oaks, so you can come over. We can can have you here and we'll put out- Well, Sherman Oaks is down the block. Exactly. Hey, listen, you guys should go into Amazon and look for the Baz Luhrmann forward on the Steve Bender book. Okay. And- I am making a documentary based on that book. Wow. And my partner is the guy who wrote the book, okay. Steve Bender. Yeah. And it, it's a big feature in the Baz Luhrmann movie, as you said, Fritz. He told Elvis where it was at. It wasn't under the Hollywood sign, but he did tell Elvis those wow. exact words. It was the first person that had been honest with him in his whole career was in that conversation. And then Colonel Parker made it a point to blacklist Steve from Vegas. So there you go. Yeah. All right, here come your closing credits. Fritz and I have created a web hub to help you shop for gifts and save democracy in one fun move. Giftofdemocracy.com curates great swaggy merch from candidates and causes committed to protecting and defending our democracy. Fritz and I make no money here. We don't need it. We are not running for office this year. Our site is like a mall directory sign that points you towards the merchandise pages of worthy candidates and causes. It's the donation that counts. Democracy makes a great gift. Thank you so much for joining us. We would love to continue this conversation with you on Instagram and Twitter, where we are at Media Path Pod, and on Facebook, where our show page is Media Path Podcast, and our Facebook group is Media Path with Fritz and Wheezy Podcast Community. You can find full video podcast episodes loaded with bonus visual content on our YouTube channel, Media Path Podcast. You can write to us at mediapathpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy this show, please give us a nice rating in Apple Podcasts and talk about us nicely on your social medias. You can sign up for our fun and dishy newsletter at mediapathpodcast.com. We want to thank our guests, Spencer Proffer, Georgia Wright, and Kenia Hale. Our team includes Dina Friedman, John Maddox, Sharon Bellio, Bill Filipiak, Thomas Hubble, Mason Brown, and you. Our theme music is by me and John Maddox. I am Louise Blanker here with Fritz Coleman, and we will see you along the media path. Yeah, it's almost painful to only talk about one project.